Hello, wherever you are, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's time for our my first recorded lesson here today. We are going to talk about our Cultural Literacy Week 10 uh, presentation today. So be totally the same as normal. So what you're going to do is you will see attached to this assignment on Google Classroom that I have put a unfilled Google Doc version of your Cultural Literacy Notes for the week. Uh, you are going to watch this video. Uh, listen to what I say, and then fill in the notes as you go. You can also make comments. Those of you who normally will highlight your notes, you can, or add extra notes in, you can make comments, et cetera. Um, my expectation is that, or what I'm imagining for this is that you'll be just pausing this video on the individual slide that you need to copy everything down. Um, I'm not uploading it in a format where you can copy and paste it because I think you should actually have to pay attention. So sue me. All right. I mean, don't see me, what am I saying? All right, so let's get started with our first reference here. First, we're gonna talk about the 12 labors of Hercules or Heracles. So uh, Her Heracles is perhaps the most important Greek hero. What you have to understand about Greek heroes is that um, Greek heroes of myth were not superheroes in the sense that we think about them. Uh, they weren't necessarily inherently good. And Heracles, by I think our moral standards in many ways, was not a good person. They are just like powerful and do kind of great works. Um, I'm going to call him Heracles. He was later renamed by the Romans. We've talked in this class before about how the Romans sort of reappropriated uh, Greek mythology. And when they did, they renamed him as the name that you probably know him, which is Hercules. So the 12 Labors of Hercules, where basically what happens is that Her Heracles or Hercules, I'm going to switch them up a lot, sorry, um, is the son of Zeus and a mortal. So he's not totally a god. And because he is the son of infidelity by Zeus, uh, Hera, who is Zeus's wife who, and not his mom, I guess like his stepmom technically, strikes him with madness. And in madness, he kills his family, and in, including his wife, Megara. Uh, it's the much darker version of what you might see in the Hercules Disney movie. Um, and in order to try to make up, he goes to Megara's brother. And uh, I think Megara's brother, I think is a King. And he goes to Megara to his, her family and is basically just like, how can I make up for, I, I killed your family member. How can I make up for that? And the King basically gives him a list of 12 un, uh, unattainable task, 12 things that can't be done. Um, so they're slaying the, the Nimian lion. A lot of them are killing like giant monsters that people thought they couldn't be killed, right? The Nimian lion, the Larian Hydra, uh, capturing the golden hind of Ar Artemis. The golden hind of Artemis was like a, a deer that was made by the goddess of hunting that was supposed to be uncatchable. Um, capture the Arithmenian boar, similar like big old monster thing. Clean the Augean stables in a single day. There was these stables where they had thousands and thousands of horses. And basically the idea was that the horses produce so much poop that there's no possible way that Heracles could uh, clean them in a single day. Um, slay the Stymphalian birds. They were just like giant bird monsters. Capture the Cretan bull. We'll talk about the Cretan bull in a second. Um, steal the mares of Diomedes. Obtain the girdle of Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazon. So the Amazons were like these big, powerful warrior women, and her girdle was this like belt that she wore that basically was a symbol of her like being the queen of the Amazons. Um, obtain the cattle of the monster Geryon, steal the apples of her, uh, Hesperides, and capture back, uh, capture and bring back Cerberus. Cerberus was the three headed dog that guarded the gates to the underworld. So it's not the individual labors that you really need to know for this reference, it's the idea that these labors were presented as sort of in bad faith, which is to say that like there was no expectation in the story that he was going to be able to do them. And since he was such a hero, he did do them much to the sort of like dismay of the king who had assigned them to them. Now, when we talk about the 12 labors of Heracles or just the 12 labors, we're generally referring to something that when we you know reference this figuratively, we're generally referring to something that is impossible or seems impossible. So like we might say, getting back on Mr. Wright's good side, was like completing the 12 labors of Her uh, Hercules, right? As in, it is something that seems impossible. We also might say that, uh, I like we also might say that something, doing something that is impossible is like, you know, capturing, it's like doing the 13th labor. So we might say, you know, perfectly capturing Mr. Lawrence's face in marble would be like the 13th labor of Hercules, but it was worth it. So, I mean, obviously look at me. That's why I, I kept the webcam on the stream just so that I knew it would, it was really soothe you to be able to see my face in this trying time. So here it is. Um, but generally speaking, when we make a reference to this, we're just kind of, it's kind of similar to a Sisyphean task. Um, it, 
Sisyphean tasks are more the difference between uh, a labor of Hercules and a Sisyphean task is the idea that like uh, the a Sisyphean task is impossible, but it's also sort of like pointless. Whereas a labor of Hercules is impossible, but would be like a great work if you accomplished it. So next, our next reference we have is the labyrinth. So this is another mythological story uh, from Greek and Roman mythology. This one's chiefly from Greek mythology. And it's basically the story of Daedalus and Icarus. So um, the labyrinth was an elaborate structure designed by and built by the legendary artificer Daedalus for the King Minos of Crete. So basically what happens is King Minos, who is the king of this island in um, the Mediterranean near Greece called Crete, he has a bull. Okay, and it's called the Cretan bull, and it's like a perfect bull, and he loves this bull. Um, something that maybe the sort of farmer culture and commerce could understand, but specifically, he loves this bull because you know at the time, if you make if a lot of your money as a society is invested in agriculture, uh, cattle are kind of as good as gold in that kind of system, and so you'll see that like a sign of value in a lot of Greek stories is cattle of some sort, goats or bulls or whatever. So basically, he has this perfect bull, and he and he. Uh, promises that he will uh, sacrifice it to Poseidon, the god of the sea. And since he's the king of an island, this seems like a prudent thing to do. Uh, basically, in the Greek religion, you would sacrifice, you would give up your possessions to the gods as a sign of fealty to them. And so saying that you would sacrifice this like perfect bull that was probably worth a lot of money and can make you a bunch of other cows and they're make you more, therefore make you more money, it was a sign of like great devotion to the gods. So uh, he goes to sacrifice it and he decides Minos does at the last minute that he is not going to, he's not going to do it because he just loves this freaking bull too much. So Poseidon, the the king of the oceans, the king of the seas, uh, decides that he has to punish Minos. And so what he does is he, he strikes Minos's wife with madness so that she is in love with the Cretan bull. Um, and, I'm not going to go into how the operation of this ends up happening, but she ends up actually having a kid with the bull, which is a very Greek mythology thing to do, which is because it's super screwed up and makes no sense. But um, so the kid that she has, the kid of this bull and Minos's wife is called the Minotaur. It is a horrible mythical creature that is half man and half bull. It has like the body of a man and the head of a bull. Um, it eventually gets killed by the Athenian hero Theseus, which we can talk about later. But basically the idea is that Minos is so embarrassed at having uh, a son sort of that is a monster and that eats humans because the Minotaur can only eat the flesh of humans that he, he gets Daedalus who is this like, you know, artificer or inventor to make a, uh, a maze that is so complex that it can't be solved. And he puts the Minotaur in the center of it. And basically the Minotaur just, eats anyone who wanders into it, I guess. Uh, eventually, Theseus kills it. Um, but the whole idea is that originally, a la the Labyrinth, capital L Labyrinth, was a proper noun that referred to this specific maze from a story. But now, the usage of it has changed such that we often refer to labyrinths as just sort of like a general word for a hard maze or something that's hard to navigate. Uh, one little interesting bit of trivia to this is that when Theseus killed it, Ariandi uh, gave him a skein of thread that was like unbreakable so he could tie it on the outside and lead the thread all the way into the, the to the maze, kill the monist, Minotaur, and then follow the thread all the way out. Well, in Greek, the word for a skein of thread or like a big roll of thread was clue, um, which is where the origin of the word C-L-U-E, clue, comes from because literally it was, you know, the skein, it was the thread that he followed in order to solve the mystery of the labyrinth. Uh, when we refer to the labyrinth today, we often, like I said, this is originally a proper noun, a capital L labyrinth, but we use the word labyrinth just to mean confusing maze. But when we're when we're referring to the proper noun version of labyrinth, we're usually talking about something that seems unnegotiable, some sort of situation that is incredibly hard to uh, navigate. So we might say something like navigating your room is like being trapped in the labyrinth. I know for some of us uh, staying at home and not going to school, this might be especially true right now. Um, we also might refer to people who are sort of fearsome in a situation as the minotaurs in the labyrinth, right? So if the school is the labyrinth, the English teachers are the minotaur. When we talk about the minotaur in the labyrinth, we're referring to something that is sort of like a monster that haunts an area. So those are our two references. And I didn't do this on the first reference, but I'll give you a moment here to pause so you can write this down. Okay, so Greek and Latin roots. Our first root today is re, which means again, back or backwards. 
Um, generally speaking, re is a Latin root that we stick as a prefix that generally just means again. Um, rewind is to take something back, right? To retrograde is to reverse in the back direction. There are all sorts of words that have re at the beginning of them. Generally speaking, uh, this is a very common prefix. The way we've talked in the past about how um, that English is sort of a bastardized language that has combined many other languages. And this is a Latin root, R-E, that often gets stuck at the beginning of words or just to indicate that we're doing something again or going backwards. Next, we have man, which means um, hand. Now, generally speaking, we use this this root word more. We use it's a prefix usually, and we use this prefix more uh, figuratively than literally. So, like if you do something manually, you're doing it by hand. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean when we say that something is manual that you literally are using your hands. But what we generally mean with it when we say a word like manual is that like you're doing it yourself instead of automating it. Um, another word that is a good example of this would be like manipulate, right? Which would be if you tried to change something or move it by hand. We also use the word manipulate to indicate sort of like a social um, scheming, right? But still you're doing that like by yourself. You're doing it by hand yourself as opposed to automatically, which I think is the, the, uh, the distinction there. So next we have our logical fallacy for the week. And I'll pause again for you to pause here. Boop, boop. All right, logical fallacy. Our logical fallacy this week is the bandwagon fallacy. So um, the bandwagon fallacy is a it's a flaw in an argument that the popularity of an idea has something to do with its legitimacy. So just because something is, is popular, it has no bearing on whether or not it's valid, right? If it did, then the earth would have made itself flat for most of history because that's what people believed, right? So you've committed this fallacy in general if you've said that you've appealed to the popularity or the fact that many people do something as an attempted form of validation. The idea behind this is that just because somebody people believe something does not mean it's true. A very kind of sad real world example of this is that there's been a lot of misinformation about the current COVID virus crisis and pandemic. And a lot of times people will kind of glom on or attach themselves to these ideas, they will bandwagon themselves into these ideas because of their popularity. Uh, an easy way to remember the the bandwagon fallacy is the idea of like uh, jumping on a team's bandwagon, right? If you're a bandwagon fan, you've just said that you like a team because they are popular. Uh, the bandwagon fallacy is sort of like the idea of a bandwagon fan, but for a concept or an argument, right? So you can see Seamus pointed his finger at Sean and asked him to explain why, how so many people could believe in leprechauns if they're only a silly old superstition. Just because a lot of people believe something doesn't mean it's true, right? For a long time, people believed that the world was flat. Well, not really that long. The first, the Greeks proved the world wasn't flat. That's kind of a canard, but it doesn't matter. Um, ben claimed that Hannah should like his favorite band because everybody else but you loves them. This is a very common thing to do with like sort of music hipsters, right? Uh, where it's like, well, everybody loves this band, so you should too. Um, or that like, you know, certain people love this band, so you should too. Uh, so that's the bandwagon fallacy. I think this is a good one to do our first remote kind of digital learning fallacy because it's pretty straightforward and it's kind of easy to remember. So uh, that has been our cultural literacy for week 10. So keep in mind that you will, I'm putting this up on Sunday and you will probably get your quiz up on Tuesday. So then this quiz will be due on Thursday. This is going to be a Google Classroom quiz. I fully understand that on these quizzes, like there's nothing keeping you from using your notes. And like, I dig that, it's fine. Um, but uh, what I would say is like, do your best to see what you can do on this without your notes, like actually take the time to study. Um, that's probably a, a vain plea for me, but whatever. All right. So this has been cultural literacy number 10. Uh, I thank you for watching this and filling your notes out. Bye.